It's basically a meme now. Ain't nothing good coming from those cornfields. This is Darkness Prevails, the place to share your true stories with the world, because this world is a strange one. From crazy kids who worship corn, to aliens that would rather spend all night flattening your crops rather than saying hello. There are all kinds of things in cornfields I think you'd rather avoid, so enjoy these allegedly true stories of the creepiest things found in cornfields. Remember, you can send your true story to me with the links in the description, and make sure to click the link down there to download some free games and support this channel. Real quick, here are the first five comments from my previous video. Christmas Lover, how appropriate, says hi. Fluffy Flappy says, hi Daddy Darkness. Look, I don't have any kids, and if you guys keep talking about that, I'm gonna have to start paying child support or something. Amy Lacrosse says, you made my day. Well, I'm happy that my videos at all can help people. It's amazing how a scary story or two can keep you out of your depression. And I'm very happy these videos can help. Jonah2103 says, yes, you uploaded. It feels really good after several hours of work to upload a video. So I'm right there with you, Jonah. Roddy says, yeet. That's a long yeet, bro. I also wanted to say hi and keep up the good work. Well, thank you for the support. I'm gonna do my best to keep you all happy and scared. Now, let's jump right into those cornfields. The harvest is bountiful this season. Number one. I won't go back in that cornfield. Submitted by Scarlet. If you've ever been in Nebraska, You'll know what I mean when I say I grew up surrounded by corn. Now, my family had nothing to do with the farmers that mostly populated the county. Rather, my mother and father worked from home. My father wrote editorials and the occasional short story, while my mother was an editor for him and part of an online team of editors. I couldn't be bothered at that age trying to understand how they made a living doing that but I was very happy to be able to live in the country. Now, my parents were good parents, so when I say they didn't really keep an eye on me out there, it's because they trusted me. At nine years of age, with no main road for about a mile down our long driveway, I was able to explore at my leisure. No need to worry about strangers, no need to worry about getting hurt. I guess my full-time job as a kid was to do my homework and play outside. And so I did. Whenever I did finish up my homework, or decided to fake being done with it, I'd go outside, play in the dirt with some of my toy cars, or walk through the fields. The farmers didn't mind. They knew my family, and they knew I wasn't some animal stomping all over their harvest. It was a different story when they had big machinery out there, but on normal, calm days like these, it was fine. Just a little girl swallowed up by the tall cornfields. Speaking of which, it was easy to get lost in them. I had a rule though. I would only walk in a straight line, and when I wanted to get back, I'd turn around and walk the other way. It never failed me. Not until that day. It was a very windy day, Gray clouds crowded the sky, and it seemed like it would rain at any moment, but it didn't that day. The air was cooler, thanks to the overcast weather, and I soon found myself outside at our picnic table, wondering what else I could be doing to keep myself from being bored. Then I decided I would walk in the cornfields again, except this time, I challenged myself to go further than I'd ever been before. I'd walk as far as I could before I had to head back for whatever reason. Maybe my parents would call for me. Maybe I'd reach a break in the fields. Who knows? This was going to be an adventure. I grabbed a couple of my toy cars, Hot Wheels to be exact, 
and I made my way through the rows of corn stalks. It only took about five minutes of walking to reach the spot I hadn't passed before, a little gap in the rows that I used for a hidden play spot. I stepped through it, continuing my corny trek. About 10 minutes later, the sky was growing even thicker with clouds. It was getting pretty dark, despite it only being around noon, and it didn't help that the corn stalks overshadowed me. I was a kid, so of course I began to panic. I needed to head back right away, so I turned abruptly in the other direction, but I managed to catch my heel on something and I tumbled onto the ground. I stood up quickly, looking around, trying to find where I was. I couldn't orientate myself. I couldn't find my tracks. In a matter of seconds, like that, I was lost in the cornfield. I began to cry, and I called out for my mother and father. I tried jumping as high as I possibly could to see over the corn, but it was no use. There was no way of knowing which way was which. I cried out again, desperate to be saved by my parents, except when I called the next time, someone replied. I know it wasn't my mother or father. In fact, whoever they were, they were very close to where I was. They sounded like they were just a few feet from where I was, hidden by the corn. Hush, don't cry anymore, it said. The voice was very deep and calm. There was a confidence to it that seemed both charming and intimidating. I can help you find your way back, it spoke after a long silence. I still couldn't find a reply. I was still panicking on the inside and I'd never dealt with strangers before, as I've always lived out in this countryside. I struggled to find even a breath to speak with, but the hidden stranger spoke again. Here, take my hand. I'll take you where you need to go. Suddenly, the corn stalks in front of me began to shake and rattle. Then the stalks began to part as an arm reached toward me and a hand beckoned for my own. It may have been quite dark in those corn stalks, but I could still very clearly see his hand, which meant I had a very good reason to stay far away from it. The hands wore gloves with fingers that broke through the tips of the gloves, like his or its hand didn't fit in them and instead busted through the cloth. And the fingers themselves, they were splattered with red, and they were extraordinarily long, with nails that were as thick as they were lengthy. Even as a child, I was convinced that whoever I was talking to in that cornfield was either a person I needed to get away from, or they weren't human at all. Instantly, I turned and ran in any other direction than the one that led to him. I ran for my life, my legs carrying me faster than they ever had before. I didn't stop, not even when my lungs burned and my jaw stung. Before I knew it, I'd broke out of the corn stalks and I had somehow managed to make it back to my house. I collapsed in the dirt, crying burying my hands in the dry soil. It's all right, child. It was the voice again. I jumped and turned toward it. Whoever he was, whatever it was, they were still hidden in the cornfield, but I could hear the smile in his voice. I'll be here whenever you're ready. I practically crawled inside. I was so scared and exhausted. My parents were all over me the moment they saw how dirty I was, how frantically I was breathing, how my face was covered in tears. Since that day, I never went back in the cornfields, but I did stare into them, always wondering if something was staring back at me. And when I did, I swear I could hear him humming. 
Number two, The Man, submitted by Adele. This story takes place a while back. I think I was either 11 or 12 at the time. I have this one friend I've known since I was learning to walk. It was more of a forced friendship rather than anything, considering our parents went to school together. My so-called friend's name was Lila, and one thing you should know about Lila is that her family is practically crazy. Her father claims to have been abducted by aliens twice. Her mother keeps bug out bags filled with supplies such as food and water in her closet for when the government takes over. And her brother thinks he's half cat and still does after graduating high school. But Lila was the worst of them all. She always goes on and on about the demons and ghosts she sees around her house, and her greatest obsession is something she calls the man. She goes on and on about him watching her through the windows of her house, and when he manages to get inside, she says he stands at the edge of her bed and watches her sleep, which anyone would be creeped out about. I know I was when I heard it. So this one time, Lila invited me over to play, which I gladly accepted. By the time I arrived at her house, her mother quickly explained that she had a work emergency and that Lila's father would be home within the next hour or so. With that, she told us to behave and then left. Since Lila was part of an outdoorsy family, the first thing she suggested we do was go for a walk. The route we usually took was a small path between a cornfield in her backyard and a small fenced off forest with a pond in the center. Usually, we would take whistles along just in case we got lost or hurt, but it didn't seem necessary since most of the corn had been recently cut and nobody would be around to hear it anyway, or so I thought. We started our trek and about a half a mile down the road, we decided to hop the fence dividing the path in the forest. It just seemed like a clever idea at the time. After a small hike to the pond, we settled down and talked, pestered the geese, and attempted to skip stones. In the middle of our conversation, Lila fell silent, ignoring the questions that I was asking her. After she continued to ignore me, I asked her again and all she replied was, he's, he's here. And I knew exactly what she meant. After growing up with her, I knew what she was talking about. I didn't always believe her, but I was always scared when she did this. I was already beginning to tear up at the mention of the man. The forest behind us was creepy enough and this wasn't helping. I told her to cut it out, and she only repeated herself again. He is here. I decided to follow her gaze out of curiosity and see what she was intently staring at. There on the other side of the pond, amongst the cornfield, standing between rows that were cut and those that weren't. He was black like a shadow. He had no face or no clothes, he looked like a cardboard cutout, but there was a breathing to his form, a movement as he stood there. That's when I started bawling, and through the tears I could tell that he was slowly coming towards us, making his way from the cornfield, around the pond, and towards us. I wasn't going to stick around and see what he had planned for us. The next few minutes were a blur, I remember grabbing the oddly calm Lila's hand and dragging her out of the forest, struggling to climb over the fence and rushing away from the cornfield. I crashed through stray branches and spider webs along the way. I got scratches all over my arms and legs as we ran back to the house. When we made it, I quickly closed the sliding glass door and I drew the curtains. We locked all the doors and closed the rest of the curtains in the house before locking ourselves in Lila's room and huddling together on her bed in fear. We were both shaking at this point. It was then I could tell the severity of the situation had hit her as well, 
because she too had tears dripping down her face. We sat there in silence, waiting for her father to come home. We didn't dare make a noise or turn on the lights because then the man would know we were there. The man could tell where we were. We saw a figure passing by Lila's window here and there as if someone outside was searching for someone else, probably us. Eventually, her father did return home, but we never did tell him about the man. Lila wouldn't let me because she claimed he already knew of him. I haven't questioned a single word she said since that day. I thought she was schizophrenic before this, but now I know the man is real and I wonder what else she has seen that is real. Number three, A Night in Scaryville, submitted by Mitchell S. In my old hometown, there are hundreds of legends and ghost stories, a haunted bar downtown, a witch in the park next to the school, a phantom jogger down one road, along with creatures and specters, whatever you want, you name it, this town has it all. I will admit that I've had my own fair share of unexplained events living here, but nothing can really top my visit to Scaryville. Scaryville, of course, isn't the actual name of the place. It's always been called that since I could remember, and no one really calls it by its real name. Even as children, we sang its old nursery rhyme. Scaryville, Scaryville, spend a night in Scaryville, meet the ghosts, pet the hounds, sleep six feet underground. Scaryville, Scaryville. The song would continue with more verses of how you would meet an untimely fate or what's waiting for you in the titular town. From first glance, you would never suspect a small village like this would be the subject of many children's nightmares and countless teenagers' dares. It sits in the bottom of a valley with only a scattering of buildings and houses surrounded by farmland, almost like a Rockwell painting, but it's the history that gets people frightened. See, while my town only had urban legends, Scaryville actually delivered. There was a priest that took children in a church across from the schoolhouse, a boy that passed from hypothermia in the same schoolhouse over winter break, a teenage girl who perished in the river, trapped inside her own truck on prom night, and there was a scientist who experimented on dogs on that same river. It just gets crazier the more you look into it. It's because of this history that has made Scaryville quite the hotspot for teenagers and thrill seekers. On Halloween, teens would spend the night at a child's graveyard, sometimes performing rituals of some kind. Sometimes they'd break into the schoolhouse or church on a dare to stay there until morning. Others like myself were just genuinely interested in seeing something there, and one fateful night, I did. The events that happened that night had to be real because I brought my best friend and his younger sister with me. Us guys had known each other for years, since middle school, in fact. We were fresh out of high school and in the midst of finding jobs and trying to figure out our lives. One hot summer night, I approached my friend, Carlisle, and suggested we go to Scaryville for a good time. He was initially hesitant of the idea. Being out that late in the middle of the country, he said he didn't want to be out too long, but I knew he was just scared. If it wasn't for his younger sister, Haley, he might have just stayed home. But she persisted and next thing you know, we all piled into my car and drove into the night. The drive to Scaryville is creepy enough. Like I said, it's in the middle of nowhere and with a full moon behind the twisting and knotted trees, it couldn't have been a more perfect night. We arrived, driving in on the one road into the village. We saw behind some dead trees the schoolhouse and the church. Obviously, that would be our first stop. I pulled off to the side of the road and parked, and we got out and began to look around. We didn't go inside either of the buildings. The doors were locked, 
and the thought of breaking into haunted locations were more than enough to deter us. Haley said she saw a light coming from the belfry in the church. Carlisle and I looked, but I didn't see anything. Perhaps it was a reflection from the moonlight, we suggested. We got back into the car and drove to the site where the girl had passed away in the water. It was even more secluded than the church and schoolhouse. The bridge where the truck ran off the road was a very cold and foreboding place to be. It seemed the farther we looked into Scaryville, the darker and more ominous it became. I shook off my unease and turned on the radio to try to lighten the mood. We got out at the bridge and began to look around. So far, our trip looking for spooks was pretty fruitless, until again Haley piped up. What's that? We turned to where she was looking and saw a pair of headlights in the far end of the road. It was the dead of night. Anybody who was anybody would be asleep by now. And even if they weren't, why were they just parked in the middle of this road in Scaryville, not moving? I could tell Carlisle was getting a little freaked out, but my initial reaction was curiosity. Let's take a look, I said. Carlisle wanted us to go home, but I reminded him that I have the keys, so what I say goes. We got in the car and advanced toward the headlights, which were still beaming at us. I drove slowly, almost as if I was afraid that I was gonna scare the headlights off. We all leaned closer to the front windshield, trying to decipher what was going on, see if we could see the person in the seat. We got about 50 feet in front of this car when the headlights went off. We suddenly found ourselves in complete darkness. When our eyes adjusted from the lack of light, we saw that there was in fact no car where the headlights were coming from. There was only one road with no turnoffs. We were all dumbfounded by this. Where had the car gone? We would have heard it if it drove away or seen it. It was like there was nothing there. Now we believed something was happening. I knew what our next stop would be, the children's graveyard just beyond the way. I accelerated, fueled by my own excitement and fear, and we drove into the night. About a minute later, the headlights returned, only now they were behind us and flashing on and off, on and off. Then they stayed off after a moment, only to show us that there was still no car behind us, no reason we should be seeing headlights at all. I asked my friends if they saw that. How could we not? They were right behind us. Carlisle panicked. Where did they even go? Asked Haley. Before I could answer, I saw it. The graveyard. It was a small plot of land on the edge of a hill. It was old, and time had taken over the graves. Most of the graves belonged to the children. That was the creepiest part. Thinking about how many children's skeletons were under our feet, I hesitated to get out, but I forced myself to. We were here to see something creepy, and it seemed like the activity was just starting. Once again, we walked around, clearly closer to each other than before. I had a bad vibe. Something wasn't right here. We looked at a few of the graves. Some of the kids were five, eight, 14 years old. One hadn't even been born, and it had a name. Just, God, that was creepy. But not as creepy as what we heard next. A giggle, a child's laugh. I stopped for a second to look at my friends who were staring back at me with wide eyes. What in the world was happening? We stood there for a second until we heard movement in the nearby cornfield. I could see the corn stalks moving and shaking as if someone was running through them. I shifted my gaze and concentrated and I could see someone in there. It looked like children running through the corn, running around in the field as if playing some game. Their giggles became more audible the longer we stood there. And I swear to God, I suddenly heard, hide, he's coming. And when we heard a sudden guttural growl coming from behind us, we ran back to the car. I fumbled to get my keys, trying to keep my composure, 
taking deep breaths. I turned the ignition on and slammed the gear shift into reverse without looking behind me. I turned my car back towards down the hill and put the car in drive and stepped on the gas. But suddenly, the car didn't do anything. Let's go, shouted Carlisle. I'm trying, I replied. I was both aggravated and scared. And then the car suddenly wouldn't turn over. I tried again and again, but it wouldn't start. Guys, Haley squeaked out. We looked at her and saw her face streaming with tears as she looked out her side window. We looked and saw something like a black mass, something with no definite shape, but it stood out like a shadow beyond the moonlight. It was tall and black and just floating there. Finally, the car lurched forward and we started rolling down the hill. Haley screamed and within seconds, I regained control of the car and hit the gas so hard, we sped right out of Scaryville. I didn't stop one second until we got back to the house. We were silent the whole way there. I parked outside the house and we just sat there, taking in everything that had just happened. When we finally got out, the air was so different, it was refreshing and relaxing. As Haley was getting out of the car, she said, almost forgot my bag. So she went to the back to open the trunk and then she let out a short scream. When I walked back there to see what was up, there were dozens of child's handprints all over the trunk of the car, as if they were behind the car pushing us or trying to get in. Number four, Skinwalker and My Family's Woods. Submitted by Anonymous. My family owns a bit of property north of where we live. I always loved wandering through their woods and cornfield, especially at night. On one of these nights, my cousin and I decided to go into the forest and walk along the edge of the rows of corn. They let their huge dog, Charlie, out with us just for some protection. My cousin is younger than me, and he doesn't believe in the paranormal like I do. So that might explain why I was a bit more creeped out than he was being out that late in the middle of a forest. We walked and walked through the woods, previously thinking we'd be having conversations and a good time, but we were actually just quiet and a bit freaked out by how dark it was, me more so. Eventually, we came to this little hut that her and her brother had built out of sticks a year ago. It was one of our frequent hangout spots, but usually during the day. Suddenly, she just screams next to me. It came out of nowhere, making me jump on the spot. Then she shouts, what's that? She stopped and was pointing towards the hut. The dog began to bark as well, and that's when I saw it. What appeared to be another dog had just emerged from the cornfield and was walking towards the hut but I saw its face and it didn't look like a dog anymore. Its face was more human than animal. And when it screeched a deafening screech at us, we both turned and ran. We made it back home safe, but her dog Charlie was out there all night barking and it sounded like he was getting into little fights with something. We weren't really sure, but we were scared he wouldn't come back but thankfully he did. I don't know what we saw that night, and it was a really quick experience. We ended up going back to the hut just to tear it down because we were afraid that something was using it as a home. The first thing that came to my mind when I saw the creature was Skinwalker, and honestly, that's what I'm gonna stick with. Either that or the most deformed and ugly dog you've ever seen. And number five. Nightmare in Elkhorn, submitted by Anonymous2196. A few years back, one day in mid-July, I went with my girlfriend up to Elkhorn. We went up there pretty often. We made pretty regular trips to Bray Road, and that day didn't seem any different at first. Upon arrival, it was the same as any other night, we drove through the road, examining anything suspicious, 
and as always, we found nothing. You see, we've heard of the Bray Road Beast and the Michigan Dog Man, and this is what we wanted to see. My girlfriend was a big believer in those things, believed that werewolves were real, but I sat there for a good 10 minutes driving around when we didn't see anything, thinking to myself how stupid it was to even think that werewolves exist. It was just a moment later that would change my life and mind forever. I was staring across the cornfields in the moonlight. I saw a figure rise and break through the surface of the corn. It had the face of a wolf, and as I stared at it, I saw that its body was more like a man. Even after all these years, I still remember the vision of it so clearly. It was muscular and scrawny at the same time, meaning the meat it had on its body was very toned and tense as if it spent most of the time on the move. Its most prominent feature, though, were those yellow eyes. They were cold and intimidating, and the only way I knew to react when I saw it was to scream, what in the world is that? My girlfriend jumped in her seat and looked over towards me, but she wasn't the only one whose attention I got, because the thing I was staring at turned its yellow eyes towards me and it began running on two powerful, long legs. I stepped on the gas, but the creature kept pace with our vehicle for the longest time, making me think we were doomed, but we finally reached town. I didn't sleep that night. I was too afraid to, even though the doors and windows were very much locked tight. If I had to say anything, if you find yourself in Michigan or near Elkhorn, be on the lookout for the dog man, because he will make a believer out of you. The only things cornfield seem to be good for is popcorn and whiskey. Other than that, they seem to breed the worst kind of paranormal entities and supernatural creatures. If you live near a cornfield or drive past one, I would just pretend it doesn't exist, because if you pay too much attention to those fields, something might look back, something might follow you home, something might just open its jaws wide and make you cease to exist. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and don't forget to send us your true stories with the links in the description. Thank you all. Stay safe out there and stay creepy.